Welcome everyone to the Stage of Change Learning Festival. Um, I can't remember which day it is at this point. I think it's day 10. Uh, it's been a long uh, and intensive learning journey, uh, but it's great to be back uh, and great to see you all. Great to be with Millie, Chad and Tom uh, as well as part of this session on policy entrepreneurship. Where we're going to explore the future role of government officials, um, particularly in light of how we are seeing government officials around the world showing up in, in, to deal with this massive pandemic and, and other roaming global issues. Um, and I was thinking uh, before kind of initiating the session that I, it's hard to really pay respect to the work that's, been, that's currently happening out there. Uh, and in, during this festival, we've actually seen and, and met a lot of those officials that are having tremendous responsibilities and tremendous challenges in dealing uh, with, with some very severe, not just COVID, but, but some very severe challenges that the world is facing. So I, I actually wanted to start this session by just recognizing that, and I didn't know exactly how to do it. So I thought, well, oh, let's do a montage. Let's do a montage where we just kind of quickly remind ourselves what those problems look like. So with that in mind, um, we are very well into this discussion, I think, um, and wanting to discuss what does government, uh, how does this rise to these challenges? Um, and we are delighted to be joined by Chad, Millie and Tom that's respectively going to share experiences both from the work they're currently doing as well as some of the previous work. Um, and, and Chad uh, from the Canadian government um, that is actually an active part of the COVID response. Millie from UNDP leading their innovation efforts um, across a number of initiatives. Um, and Tom with a very huge background in, in advising Obama on, on policy entrepreneurship. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing those perspectives and into the discussion. And I would encourage uh, participants both to uh, don't hold back on asking questions using the chat function uh, as well as maybe just taking a moment initially to tell us where you're dialing in from. Um, that would be great as well to, to, to hear that. But with, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over to Chad, who's going to lead us into the conversation. Thanks, Chad. Well, thank you, Jesper. And uh, hello to everybody out there that's, uh, that's dialed in for this um, great session uh, that uh, that Jesper is leading. It is a it is a very, very humbling situation that we're in at, the, at this point in time around the world um, with respect to the pandemic. But uh, as I think the montage explained at the outset of this, uh, this session, it is also extremely uh, poignant that there are so many other issues that are that are facing the world at this point in time. So the role of the policy entrepreneur and what we can do as officials that are operating in the government space or perhaps in the uh, the, the quasi government space or, or NGO space can be extremely helpful in, in um, in the work that we're doing to, to help address some of this. So let me kind of structure my thoughts uh, in kind of two different camps. The first is what my, uh, I guess my most recent former day job was. Uh, and then I can transition that over into what I think my current job is. Uh, and I say, I think in, in kind of uh, real terms because it is an ever evolving uh, and highly um, kind of agile environment that, that I'm in. And I'll get to that in a, in a very quick second. Uh, so my, my day job essentially uh, is the director of operations of a group uh, called the Impact and Innovation Unit inside of the Privy Council Office uh, of the Government of Canada. So the Privy Council Office is 
the, uh, the equivalent of the Prime Minister's Department uh, within the federal bureaucracy of the Government of Canada. Uh, and we were set up uh, in 2017 in order to uh, promote the use and application of uh, uh, innovative ways to um, uh, address complex problems in uh, our society. We focus mostly in on the uh, use of uh, outcomes-based programming instruments, uh, such as challenges, prizes. Uh, we use behavioral insights, uh, and behavioral science in, in, uh, in very precise ways, uh, as well as look at the use of pay-for-success instruments uh, from a programming perspective. Uh, but there is an element, uh, and this is where the link into uh, policy entrepreneurship is, uh, is, is quite real. We have a, a role as well in uh, how we are uh, helping the public service itself, itself adapt uh, and become more innovative and much more um, experimental in, in the way we do our, our, our work as bureaucrats. Uh, just a very quick kind of evolution on that, um, because the government of Canada has a, had a bit of a uh, an interesting relationship with uh, with innovation over uh, many many years, many many decades. To be to be completely honest, uh, first thing I would say is uh, where where some of the structural elements of, of policy entrepreneurship have come into kind of really sharp focus. Probably started about ten years ago when a deputy minister level committee. So kind of at the highest levels of, bureauc uh, of bureaucracy in, in government was struck to look at this kind of very interesting mode of communication around, uh, around social media. Uh, and not surprisingly, um, this kind of deputy minister committee on social Social media was was uh, was kind of looking at things that uh, they weren't necessarily prepared to uh, or, or well equipped to to deal with, uh, and one of the uh, one of the great responses I think of uh, of the time was to look towards a young. Uh, group of public servants to help advise uh, on the, I guess, the, the, the use of social media, the application of social media, and the opportunities around it uh, to, to help um, kind of understand it and, and advance uh, priorities of, of the government. Um, and, and so when you look at kind of the humble beginnings around that in such a, such an, a small sort of uh, setting, which we now probably take for granted, uh, and we look through the, the couple of, of steps that have taken kind of post that initial start, um, we look at an evolution of deputy ministers uh, focusing in on policy innovation. Uh, so that original deputy committee on social media uh, was transformed into a deputy minister committee on um, uh, on policy innovation, uh, which was then subsequently turned into a, a, a deputy minister task force on. Um, on, uh, uh, on public sector innovation as well. Uh, so there's been this really interesting uh, kind of focus on the, uh, on the uh, uh, approach uh, and use of innovation as a means to, to help accomplish uh, bureaucratic and broader societal goals. Uh, a key component of that has been the incorporation of what we call policy entrepreneurs in a, in a very formal sense um, in, inside of the work of that committee. And I had the pleasure over the course of a number of years of working with a select group of what we called Government of Canada or GC entrepreneurs uh, to work directly with the committee, to work directly on these horizontal, very challenging projects uh, that not necessarily had a home uh, in different areas uh, of, a, of a department or of a multiple departments, uh, but they worked on things like disruptive technologies, they worked on uh, specific issues that were need, uh, that were viewed as being uh, important to, to untangle and, and start to advance in certain ways. Some of those in many of our corporate functions, whether they're HR or finance or, or information technology. Uh, and so, uh, so there was a there was actually kind of a fairly formal role uh, around uh, this kind of concept of a policy entrepreneur, uh, which aligned extremely well with both um, kind of the the the. The, the notion that we need to embrace innovation much more, uh, much more specifically inside of our work inside of government, uh, but it also aligned very well with kind of that other side of my job, uh, which I did on a, or which I do on a daily basis around uh, promoting the the use of innovation through new tools and approaches on the programming side of things. Um, if you fast forward to uh, uh, 
where we were kind of just immediately prior to the, to the COVID situation, uh, there was a really interesting development, which again, I think demonstrates kind of the importance and the growing need for, for innovation inside of government, which is um, a decision that was made by the clerk of the Privy Council, which is Canada's kind of top public servant, uh, to uh, uh, disband or, or, or kind of not uh, have a further mandate for the, the Deputy Minister Task Force on Public Sector Innovation, which on one hand was a bit, um, a bit interesting, but the, on the flip side of it, the decision was made to integrate innovation into every single Deputy Minister Committee uh, that is operating. So there are probably around eight or 10 different deputy minister committees, uh, each of them now having a mandate for public sector innovation and the use of innovative approaches to address the kind of complex problems that they're, um, that they are addressing. Uh, uh, so there's a bit more kind of um, a systematic approach to the use of, uh, of this kind of concept uh, across the, the different domains of government. The second thing is, is that uh, the clerk himself who chairs what's called the, the Board of Management and Renewal, uh, one of the more senior deputy minister committees inside of Government of Canada um, is looking to kind of continue this tradition along uh, with a bit more of a focus on that um, kind of public sector renewal and the focus of innovation on a on a, on a day to day basis. So, uh, what I have kind of witnessed over the course of that sort of ten year period is a very uh, kind of humble beginning to the use of innovation and the incorporation of policy entrepreneurs into uh, more formal structures at fairly high levels inside of government, uh, but then uh, kind of seeing its, its evolution. Uh, continue over time where we have seen things rest in uh, uh, much more systematic ways inside of some of our, our more formal uh, bureaucratic structures. I think one of the greatest uh, kind of things that we were able to experience over this uh, period of time over the last couple of years was working directly with Yesper uh, and the States of Change team to uh, provide that kind of formalized training around entrepreneurship uh, in a public sector setting. Uh, to, to help them learn and understand the use of tools that are uh, required to have an impact inside of, uh, inside of your day-to-day -day work uh, within a very large and obviously complex organization that, that government often is. Uh, so that's kind of the that's kind of the interesting uh, background and, and kind of the link to, to where we are at today. Um, I want to kind of maybe transition over to where where uh, where my work is at this very moment, uh, as it relates to the COVID uh, crisis that's facing the the globe, um, and and maybe kind of link a a, a bit of a. Uh, 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 kind of entrepreneurship uh, aspect into uh, into that. So the team that I work with inside of the Impact and Innovation Unit is about, uh, I would say roughly 17 uh, people. So it's not a very big organization, not a very big team, uh, but, um, but what has happened in the context of uh, the COVID crisis is that for all intents and purposes, uh, the, the entirety of our team has been redeployed into the effort uh, to help combat the, the the crisis, and I would say it in kind of three different groups is, is where uh, our work has kind of evolved. Uh, so the first is, I just kind of start with myself. I've been asked to lead the, uh, the ad hoc cabinet committee on the government of Canada's response to the COVID crisis. Uh, so I'm the director of operations of that cabinet committee, which has been leading uh, the, the real formal cabinet discussions that ministers are having to, to help the government of Canada uh, respond to and help manage and mitigate the, the, the crisis across the country. So just like all of your respective countries, we're talking about border measures, we're talking about stimulus, we're talking about uh, support programs, we're talking about um, uh, support for vulnerable populations and so on. Uh, so there's all sorts of components to that. Second uh, area that I would say is kind of critical to this uh, is my, uh, my boss within that impact innovation unit has been uh, kind of lent off to the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is also uh, quite clearly a, a, a critical component to the, to the work that's, uh, that's happening. Uh, so we have kind of two of our, our senior leaders within the organization that have been put on to very important 
goals inside of the government's overall response. And then the third piece I would say is our behavioral um, science team, uh, which kind of undertakes a number of, of trials to help uh, um, uh, obviously uh, uh, promote the uptake and, uh, and um, kind of good use of, uh, of government policies, uh, has been working extremely closely with the government, uh, the overall government communications uh, response to help understand which messages are working, which are not, uh, areas where we can better understand Canadians' response to certain measures that the government's taking and start to kind of um, modify them as uh, as that data comes in on a regular basis. So I would say it's a very strong nod to the competency and the, the, the level of uh, trust that, uh, that this kind of small group of entrepreneurs inside of the government uh, has had insofar as their, their redeployment across the system to help during this, this great time of need. Maybe the last thing I'll just kind of say, and I hope that, that we get into some of this discussion as, as we move along the way, um, is uh, there is a, there's going to be a tremendous amount of need for policy entrepreneurs for the skills that entrepreneurs provide uh, inside of this uh, very sharply shifting environment that we're in. And uh, I think what I would say is, uh, you know, I would have a number of, of thoughts and perspectives to offer around that. I do want to kind of give give uh, the floor back over to, to my presenting colleagues. Uh, but without question, uh, I would encourage you to, um, to certainly uh, look at and understand how as an entrepreneur, you can find those points of influence uh, and be extremely um, uh, kind of, um, uh, uh, extremely uh, well prepared to jump into uh, those areas of opportunity for uh, innovation for entrepreneurship in your organization because uh, I know it's going to be needed uh, as, uh, as governments and as organizations and as societies, we need to respond on an ongoing basis. So J Jesper, I'll turn that back to you now. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. Um, thanks for that overview and, and um, uh, certainly, uh, the, yeah, some of those points uh, and maybe diving a bit deeper into what, what that looks like in concrete terms, that will be, be really interesting. Uh, but really encouraging to hear that that it sounds like a unit like yours is kind of being just deployed in both horizontal and domain specific and use oriented ways uh, that seems all from a very sort of strategic uh, standpoint. Um, I'm happy. I think Millie, uh, maybe you can pick pick up this conversation um, and put some more meat on, on that bone in, in terms of what what this stuff looks like uh, and what has been called for in this particular time. So Millie, over to you. Sure. Thank you so much, Jesper, and thank you, Chad. That's, it's inspiring to see the nuts and bolts of, of how this process has worked before and how it has sort of shot off after the pandemic hit. Um, so from, from our end, working at UNDP, um, first, there's a shout out here to Alberto Cotica and Ed Riders, with whom about three years ago, we started this program called Bureaucrat Hackers, because in our work, we've noticed that there is a profile in public sector that facing the same um, restraints, the same constraints, sort of like lead user work, uh, they tend to do some extraordinary things in public sector and tend to be the embodiment of what Marianne Mazzucato calls to be an um, entrepreneurial state. So from a, a, a duo of friends who were protesting one day on the streets in Kiev to uh, being part of the government and building a procurement uh, a, a mechanism called Prozoro in Ukraine that has so far saved $2.5 billion to the government, to Bologna, city of Bologna, coming up with new regulations to uh, 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 sort of provide the structure for volunteers in the city to engage. Now, two, three years ago, um, we've tried to pitch this idea to a number of donors and say, look, there's a profile in public sector. While the trust in the government is going down, these guys are what the public sector is about. Invest in creating a network, linking them together, um, they are the future of the public sector. And we, we were not successful at all. I mean, the, the initiative, as much as I was in love with it, and Alberto as well, absolutely failed, uh, uh, failed, failed in, its, uh, in its tracks. Fast forward a few, few years and, and pandemic strikes. And uh, this quote from Martin really sort of aims to, to, to highlight the, the COVID dividend when it comes to policies. But what we've seen is an absolute reemergence and rebirth of, of, of public entrepreneurs because it's those people who have actually come to the foreground and who are leading on rolling out some of the 
some of the bold policy moves and policy programs that are extending social services to the whole uh, whole of society, um, designing uh, digital education for 50 million kids. Um, some of our colleagues from Bangladesh are online, so shout out to them as well. Um, so what I would like to talk about is run through a few of those examples of what we're saying, seeing, uh, put forward, and this is for discussion, some of the patterns that tend to emerge from their work and then end with a couple of questions for the group uh, uh, that we can engage over uh, to really talk about how do we move from this being uh, uh, you know, a bug in a system to being a feature, uh, a feature in the system. So that's, that's what I would kind of steal a couple of uh, next minutes of your time uh, on. So um, we have Lana Tromka from Brazil, who uh, in 2018, when there were a bunch of national protests in the country, she's a director general of the Senate, um, sort of thought if there were more protests that would actually get us as the Senate to uh, not be able to physically uh, legislate, um, we don't have business continuity plan in place. So she wanted to invest in digital infrastructure for that and had a really hard time finding friends who would allow her to do that, but she finally did it. Um, WHO announced a pandemic one day. On day seven, Brazil casts its first digital vote in 169 uh, year long history of the country. It's the first Senate who has gone digital. So not just the digital infrastructure, but the team had to think on the go, what are the diff how do we need to change procedures to enable legislating uh, digitally? Again, eight days after the pandemic, uh, pandemic struck. Um, uh, so uh, Mayor Aki Sawyer from Freetown, uh, she designed this uh, property tax that is meant to uh, uh, predominantly address and increase costs on the, so to be more progressive, uh, to uh, tax more the wealthier, uh, wealthier properties, one, and two, to create the tax that is verifiable, transparent, and open where anybody can see why are certain households paying a certain tax. Pandemic hits, and she's faced with the choice whether she goes into the response mode or whether she actually uses this, puts some of the political capital among others into this uh, measure in order to continually fill uh, uh, the, the municipal budget as to be able to fund unprecedented need for uh, social programs that arose in the, uh, in the city. And, sh and she's done it. The first, uh, the first bills um, have gone out on, on June 1st, so just, just 10, uh, 10 days ago. Um, Sina Lawson, uh, the Minister of Digital in Togo, in seven days from scratch, builds a digital infrastructure to push out cash transfer to 1.3 million in a country of 7.7 .7 million um, workers in the informal sector. And does so by giving more cash to women than men in order to safeguard or rather to recognize uh, the role that women have in sort of uh, investing in, in household, if you will. Seven days absolutely from scratch. The minister was on the phone to places from Berkeley to New York trying to work out certain aspects of, of the policy together, uh, together with her team. And we see something similar um, in this program in, in Pakistan uh, uh, that a senior, senior advisor to the prime minister uh, was running. These are just a couple of stories uh, um, that we've come across um, that and again, this is for discussion. There are a couple of patterns that come out, and I've just noticed that all of them are women in this example. I have not thought of that uh, before. <laughs> there is something uh, to look into. We'll go back through our podcast list because we kind of gotten all of these guys to speak to us on the podcast. All of them are women. Um, there are a couple of things that tend to emerge, or at least I think they do, um, and, and, and would love to have a conversation about this, right? So one, these are kind of real-time, high-speed, extra-large uh, missions. This, this name comes from um, something that Indy Johar and I are working on currently. We see a couple of things coming, coming up. One, um, investing into the future, right? Being able to have the political capital and that sort of policy entrepreneurship, knowing how to get things done and secure the investment and the mandate into something that might be called the redundancy in the framework of you know, getting to efficiencies, but it's really a new way of operating if we take bailouts to be a new, a new normal, right? So these people have had the political acumen, ability to get a mandate and skills to get funding, to invest into something that wasn't critical today, but they had the foresight um, to build something that might come in handy when the disaster strikes. One, two, 
collapsing delivery and policy, and I think this is something that Tom has had immense experience on, we've seen these policy entrepreneurs um, sort of say, we need to go out. And again, COVID, as I think Julia pointed out in one of the webinars, it's forced, the governments have been forced to experiment. There has been no time to debate and have national public consultations. They've had to go out and deploy big programs. And in doing so, collapse delivery and policy, but most significantly be able to come and say, we don't know how this might work. We don't know how this might affect certain aspects of the demographics. We need to go out. And as we learn, pivot and tweak and, and get things improving. This is the second one. Um, three, be comfortable with and navigate different sources of data. So in, in case of Freetown, the mayor used satellite data to map uh, uh, the, the roofs of the households and then sent, sent thousands of people in the field to sort of look at the quality of the walls and the roofs and the windows and what have you. Um, we see this also with the Senate, we see this with, with cash transfers. Uh, you know, what has credibility in terms of evidence for the most part is what comes out of national statistical institutes. And we're increasingly seeing, especially now, that that type of data is out of date the, the second it comes out. And we need to be comfortable with sort of uh, um, uh, navigating and playing with different sources of data. Four, ability to, I mean, this is, some of these are painfully common sense, I would say, but a colleague of mine says common sense is often not, not that common, um, and I tend to agree. Um, ability to work across governments to pivot in real time. So in Pakistan, uh, we saw that um, what happens when an illiterate person who owns a phone needs to send the message to qualify for the cash transfer? They can't write, right? So how do you work out how do you quickly move from, from words into images to allow them to do that, lest they stay without the cash transfer? Um, the fourth one is around uh, public-private uh, public partnerships. We've seen governments who don't outsource critical services, right? So who do them in-house, be able to also rope in private sector on a very different basis, on the basis of shared value. So in Pakistan and Togo right now is the telecoms that are thinking together with the government on how to do the cash transfers for individuals who are, uh, uh, who are illiterate. This is the type of work that we want to, to have to, to see more of. And the last one is be able, be able and be comfortable, just like with data, to use various different platforms for open and frank and continued communication to keep people sort of uh, uh, moving forward. So these are some of the patterns I end. This is the last slide. Um, I think the really striking thing to note is that all of these big, bold policy moves are happening in a context, and this is the graph on the right that Lan Pritchett from Harvard just put out a couple of days ago, um, where the capabilities of government have either stayed the same or decreased in lower to lower middle income countries over the last 20 years. So while the challenges are getting more complex, they're unprecedented, we've never faced them before, before, the capability of the governments are sort of staying the same or decreasing. In that context, you have these individuals who are making these extraordinary things happen. So the questions are, do we need a crisis? So there was a colleague from the Victoria government who said, I almost want the engineer pandemic to go on a little bit further because we're saying public, seeing public servants and political appointees work, working well together. So do we need a crisis to have this type of work come out? One, two, what are the organizational conditions to create the space for policy entrepreneurs to do this type of work? And the last question is, if we are able to connect these individuals into a network that's more visible, that's in the world's face, as in here are the people who are saving lives day in and day out and have been for the last three months, this is what we want more of. Is this one of the best insurance policies that we might have um, when it comes to the next uh, uh, next pandemic? I stop here. Yes, we're over to you. Thanks very much, Millie. That was that was really interesting and and good to get a sense of both the spread of solutions as well as some of the patterns you're seeing. And I I think that's a, actually a perfect segue to you, Tom. There's a lot of questions and and insights there to pick up on. Uh, so great to hear your experience and, and thoughts also on the, on the current, and as well as what we should be looking for in the future of, of public service. Sure, yeah, I'll just say a little bit about my own um, personal experience uh, with, with trying to be a, a policy entrepreneur, um, and then to create an environment uh, to both recruit 
uh, and prepare more people to be uh, policy entrepreneurs and then maybe conclude as Millie did with some of the questions that I'm, I'm most interested in. So I had the good fortune to work for both uh, Presidents Clinton and Obama. And my job, one of my jobs was to interact with the science agencies, the uh, academic research community, research intensive firms, civil society organizations, investors, to see if there were ideas or problems that were bubbling up from those communities that at least in my view were worth the president of the United States paying attention to and getting behind. So uh, I'll just give you one example. So one of the questions uh, that I used to ask people is in the same way that um, President Kennedy decided let's put um, uh, astronauts on the moon by the end of the decade and have them safely returned. What are the similarly ambitious goals that we should be setting in the 21st century? Um, and every once in a while, I would get a really good answer to that question. So there were a group of researchers who thought that the time was right to try to do for neuroscience what the Genome Project had done for genetics. So not only had we figured out how to sequence the human genome, but we had driven the cost of doing that from $100 million uh, for the first one to $1,000 today. Um, and their, the, the hypothesis uh, of their, the initiative that they proposed is that we're currently limited by the tools that we have. Uh, we can measure the activity of a small number of neurons, or we can take a fuzzy picture of your entire brain, but we can't do anything in the middle. And if we could, that would dramatically increase our ability to understand how the brain encodes and processes information. That could uh, inform the next generation of artificial intelligence, and it could improve our ability to diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases of the brain. So um, I thought that was a pretty good idea. Uh, I consulted with neuroscientists within the government, and we were able to build a co coalition that included the National Institutes of Health, um, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the National Science Foundation, and other agencies as well. Uh, President Obama decided to announce this in, in April 2013, and uh, the Congress decided to do something that they almost never do, uh, which is to provide uh, 10 years of funding for the NIH component uh, of the initiative. Generally, they only make uh, budgetary decisions um, one year at a time. So that's what a good day would look like for me. That is, uh, people would bring me ideas. Uh, I would identify some that I thought were particularly promising and then try to figure out how would I build the coalition of the willing and able necessary to actually make that happen. So that now, um, if you, if you go to a meeting that has the researchers who are working on the brain initiative, uh, it will feel uh, a really large conference center uh, and exciting research results are, are starting to come out of that. Um, the, the other thing that I worked on was uh, to uh, recruit people who had an idea that they were excited about and wanted to try to figure out how to make it happen. Um, a lot of the jobs in the government uh, don't come up with a owner's manual. So there's a, a large amount of, of learning by doing. Uh, one of the things that I tried to do for the members of my team was to give them some thought experiments. And I'll just share one of these. So the thought experiment is that uh, you have a, a 15 minute meeting with President Obama um, and he says, Jesper, um, if you give me a good idea for uh, advancing the state of the art of policy entrepreneurship, I will call anyone on the planet. It can be a conference call, so there can be more than one person on the line. If it's someone inside the government, uh, like the director of the Office of Management and Budget, I can, I can order them to do something because I'm their boss. If it's someone outside the government, like a CEO or the head of a foundation, I can challenge them to do something. So Jesper, uh, what you need to do is to, is to tell me what's your idea and why you're excited about it. And in order to make it happen, who would I call and what would I ask them to do? So there are several reasons for the thought experiment. One is that um, one of the privileges of working for the president is that you can send the president a decision memo and have him check the box that says yes. Um, so if that happens enough time, you begin to develop a very strong sense of agency. 
uh, that is a sense that there are more things in the world that are potentially changeable because they're the result of human action or inaction as opposed to the laws of physics. Um, very difficult to do something about speed of light. Um, so that's one, is, is how do you convey that strong sense of agency that you develop over time to someone who hasn't had that experience yet? The second thing is the very banal observation, uh, as, as Millie said, you know, sort of uncommon common sense, <clears throat> which is most hard and significant problems are going to require uh, building a, a, a coalition. It's not something you're gonna be able to do by yourself. Well, it's very difficult to build a coalition if you can't articulate who are the members and what are the mutually reinforcing steps that you want them to take. Um, and after you know the answer to that, then there's a bunch of follow-up questions like, why is it in their enlightened self-interest? Uh, maybe member A of your coalition is willing but not able, and member B can relax whatever constraint uh, member A is, is operating under. Or uh, another thing is, maybe I'm not the right person to call A, B, and C. Maybe I need to get someone else to call them. Um, or... Uh, uh, you know, the, those, how can I make it as easy as possible for A and B to do, or at least consider what I want them to do? Um, so that's the second reason is you have to build coalitions. It's very difficult to do that if you can't articulate the members of the coalition and the mutually reinforcing steps that you want them to take. The third reason is that it's a version of something called the Hamming question. Um, uh, uh, Hamming was a researcher at Bell Labs. And when he was in the cafeteria, he would turn to his colleagues and he would say, what is the most important question in your field? And then he'd say, what are you working on? Um, and sometimes that would force people to confront that they just told you that they were not working on the thing that they considered to be most important in their area of expertise. So presumably, Jesper, if you really had had a meeting with Obama, you would pitch him on like, what you thought was like the most important thing, not like a second or, or third tier issue. And finally, if you ask this question to enough people, you will uh, occasionally, it's fairly rare, but occasionally uh, find someone who has a hypothesis for what Bucky Filler called a trim tab. And the trim tab is the tiny little device that moves the rudder that can move an ocean liner. Um, and I'll just give you one example of this. So in the late 1970s, uh, the Department of Labor changed the definition of uh, the fiduciary responsibilities of, of uh, professionals who are responsible for managing pension funds and decided for the first time that a prudent expert, which was the standard, was allowed to take some percentage of the assets of that pension fund and put it in a high risk, high return asset class. Well, that led to a dramatic increase in the amount of institutional investment that was going to venture capital. So if you think about the first and second order consequences of that decision, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't even something that required a, a law. Uh, it was something that the Department of Labor could do through regulation, and it wound up having a, a, a large impact. So I'm always on the lookout for people who you know, actually have a hypothesis for the idea that they would pitch if they had a meeting with the, with the President of the United States. So those were the types of things that I tried to teach uh, the members of my team and they did all these amazing, amazing things from um, you know, uh, the, the first ever White House Science Fair, an effort to prepare and recruit 100,000 uh, high quality math and science teachers over the next uh, 10 years, um, setting up the equivalent of the UK's uh, behavioral insights team, which in the US was called the social and behavioral sciences team, reducing the waiting list for an organ transplant. And they developed the, uh, the, the skill sets and the mindsets to go from an idea to something positive uh, happening in the world, creating these uh, positive uh, self-fulfilling prophecies. And the question that I, I wanted to leave people with um, and that I'm really interested to engage in uh, discussion and, and Q&A is, if I had to critique uh, the efforts of the Obama administration, uh, we were successful in, in getting what I would call early adopters. 
um, that is that there was a relatively small percentage of the federal uh, workforce that took some of these tools, whether it's the uh, incentive prizes that we were able to get every agency prize authority. Um, we increased the use of uh, tour of duty uh, hiring authority, particularly in the wake of healthcare.gov um, to recruit people from industry to work on things like the development of citizen facing um, uh, digital services using human centered design and more modern software engineering practices. Um, we increased the use of uh, techniques for evidence-based policy, um, dozens of different approaches to uh, problem solving. And I'm proud of the work that we did, but I think a limitation was if you said, what's the denominator of the United States federal government? The millions of people that work there, the over $4 trillion that we spend, and the numerator is the percentage of that activity and those people that we influenced using these approaches. Uh, it's still at the periphery rather than the core. So the challenge that I'm interested in um, is the governments, the government, at least that I worked in, had less well-developed mechanisms uh, for doing something that the, the private sector uh, would, would sometimes do. Is IB, IBM, for example, said design is so important that we want uh, lots of people within IBM to, to know how to use human-centered design, not just our designers. Um, and at least in the U.S. government, our capability to do that was uh, more limited. Um, and I'm very interested in, in talking to uh, public sector entrepreneurs and policy entrepreneurs who have, have thought about this issue of scaling and, and going, taking some of these practices from the periphery to the core. Great. Thank you, uh, Tom. That, that was really uh, very helpful and very practical. A uh, way of kind of making explicit some of the practices uh, of policy entrepreneurship, um, and and I think maybe picking up on your question and combining it with one of Millie's questions, uh, and also there was a question in the chat about about um, what this looks like from a from a tools angle. Um, so so one question would be, what does the what are, what kinds of tools? Um, if this is a question of tools. Uh, um, I don't know if it is, uh, should we be integrating? Um, and this goes to, I guess, the, the, the question of, of scale. Is, is that then something you could do at scale and what does that look like? Um, in, our, in our practice, it's, it's a lot to do with mindsets as well. And, and that posed the question of whether this is, this is a hiring challenge more than a learning challenge or a training challenge. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on, on those two in, in combination. So maybe Chad or Millie, if you wanna go on that. Sure, I, I can maybe start. Um, I, I'm very much of the view uh, that they're, rather than focusing in on the, the tools, it's actually the skills. Uh, and I'm actually, I was seized very much by what Tom, Tom used the word, the banal. Uh, and I actually will say that the skills that are required to do policy entrepreneurship uh, are really some of the most banal things that we actually have, uh, uh, that we actually need to, to kind of focus on. Well, I'll give you maybe four examples. So the first is the, the skill of listening. Um, and that I think we often as entrepreneurs really want to get focused in on, uh, hey, look at my great, idea, my great idea for which to do something, when in fact, if we listen, uh, we're actually getting data from the decision makers or from the influencers in the system that will allow us to make our idea better and find eventually a spot of um, uh, kind of approval at the end of the day. The second skill I would say is uh, one around, of around collaboration and what I believe uh, we don't do well inside of big organizations is collaborate as, as well as we probably should, uh, both within the organization and with others in, in other organizations. Uh, and we probably need to figure out how to, uh, to collaborate better, to not um, simply say like my way is the best way. We need to, to uh, I think, look at alternative ways of arriving at the end goal, uh, which may sometimes uh, require us to, to take a, a slightly different path towards getting there. But that is really based off of the collaboration that's required to, to do that. 
partnerships is, is and the partnership development is, is kind of the third skill that I think is absolutely required uh, for this, this good work. Uh, and that's essentially picking up on uh, the notion that we as a government or we as uh, an organization inside or outside of government do not have the tools or resources or the skills to do this from A through Z. Uh, we do need to partner. We do need to partner in ways that uh, oftentimes don't necessarily become that apparent at the outset. Uh, and so we, we really should focus in on, on, uh, on partnership development as a skill. And then the fourth thing uh, it is uh, the skill of around measuring. Uh, we need to, uh, I think because policy entrepreneurs have to go through so many different hoops along the way in that collaborative building space, in understanding how to uh, kind of navigate through a culture which essentially wants to reject them as a bit of the outright kind of, uh, kind of start to this, this, uh, this discussion. Uh, measurement is the way to actually prove that your approach is both meaningful and achieving results. And that means that you have to understand what your, your kind of ultimate objective is. You have to measure along the way. And frankly, you have to probably uh, tell a story uh, that is going to be better than what the current uh, system of operation actually is. Uh, so if you kind of take those four things together, uh, my sense is, is that those are the, the kind of the skill sets that you're you're uh, you're going to require it is banal at the end of the day there's no there's no kind of fancy thing that is going to allow you to kind of uh, uh, take off uh, uh, and do something wildly different uh, than what 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 those skills would uh, I think allow uh, but it is it is kind of that pure uh, pure hard work uh, and and focus on those those skills that will help you get there my two cents yes sir Uh, you called on me as well on this. I'm, I'm, mine was going to be a lot less rigorous than Chad's here. Uh, I, I would say what I have heard um, from, from these people making really extraordinary things happen is optionality. All of them are obsessed about they themselves having more options, different ways in which they're able to look at the problem, different ways in which they're able to, to, to address it, and also driving their teams um, to bring those options to the table all the time. Now, getting to that, I think there are at least two big, two big entry points to that, right? One is having organizational culture, or gonna, you know, conditions in, in the organization that kind of create the space for that. But I think if we were to wait for that to happen in most governments, just we would be waiting for a really long time. Um, the other entry point is, you know, go work for Tom. <laughs> he seems to be the kind of boss who's going to be creating space for that to happen. But in all honesty, you know, uh, uh, Yvonne uh, Aki Sawyer, the, the mayor from, um, from Freetown, the, the senior advisor to the Pakistan prime minister, all of these people are absolutely manic about options, 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 where mainstream public sector tends to diverge fairly quickly, whether because of the way that it is structured and programs funding sort of silos, log frames, give me a silver bullet right away, that it decreases the space for that optionality. And those questions that we heard Tom ask, you know, what is the most important question in your field? Where are you? What is the distance between you and it? If you walk up, if you walked into your office every Monday morning with that as a sort of a temperature check of where you are, you can't unknow that. Right. So I would say there is there is a, a measure of personal initiative and personal responsibility here. One, two, team, three, those organizational sort of uh, conditions. And I think as we move forward, they become harder and harder to influence. Thank, thanks, Millie. And, and maybe just to, to follow up on that, uh, the, the, the personal element or the personal sort of drive or activation. Uh, we often talk about kind of people um, uh, regaining the sense of purpose uh, around why they became public servants in the first place. And it seems to me that some of this is, is sort of leading to that as well. Um, but I, I want to pick you up the other question, which you sort of commented on a little bit, Tom, in the chat as well, around power. Um, and uh, you also talked about this sort of sense of agency rather than um, maybe having formal power to do stuff. Um, so if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on, on how do you do policy entrepreneurship without 
being maybe close to power or having access to direct kind of powerful people like Obama or the likes of those people. Yeah, so I definitely agree that it, in a sense it's sort of cheating uh, mm -hmm. if, if you get to work for the president. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So <laughs> I, I think one, uh, I would have a couple of answers. Um, one is the distinction between influence and authority. So a lot of times people will say, well, I don't have the authority to make this happen without recognizing that they, they may have the ability to exert influence even when they, they don't have formal authority. So for example, uh, they may not work for the powerful person, but maybe they know who the you know, special assistant is who works for the, uh, for the, you know, the decider. Um, so getting more comfortable with using, being able to use your second and third degree connections uh, to advance your agenda, um, developing lots of relationships with people on the basis of uh, trust, mutual understanding, and, and reciprocity, not in a sort of tit for tat sense. Oh, you'll uh, I'll do X for you if you do Y for me, but sort of a more generalized reciprocity. Um, and then I think that there's things that uh, governments can do uh, that are not very resource intensive. Um, so. The, the chief technology officer of HHS, Brian Sivak, uh, during the Obama administration, his point of view was, um, even if it was a relatively small fraction of the HHS employees uh, who had a really interesting and high impact idea, they had 60,000 employees. That, that's a lot of ideas. And so they said, we're gonna create a process where people can self-nominate and say, I see an opportunity for us to improve the following service uh, that HHS is responsible for delivering, and they would get political top cover, a certain amount of their time, uh, a little bit of, of funding, and then experiential learning in human-centered design and the uh, lean startup uh, methodology. And that often was enough for them to develop a, uh, a prototype of their idea uh, and then get additional support on the basis of that. So that's, that's something that is relatively straightforward uh, for an agency to do. Um, and there's, there's no shortage of areas where there is a, a large gap between where we are today and where we would like to be, uh, you know, both in government, in our economy, and our society. So it's not like we have a shortage of problems uh, that, that we need to solve. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of times people who are uh, closest to the problem are going to have the most tangible ideas for, for what to do about it. Uh, and empowering them, I think, is, is definitely one approach. If we think about not only empowering the government, but empowering uh, society as a whole, uh, another approach that I quite like is the government, uh, in consultation uh, with people who are close to the problem, uh, identifying the goal and then being much more agnostic about which team or approach is most likely to be successful. Um, so, you know, we're talking about vaccines. Uh, one of the things that governments have done uh, for vaccines is something called an advanced market commitment, where they tell the private sector, we will bear the demand risk if you bear the performance risk. We will commit to buying this many vaccines at this price per dose uh, and uh, you can be confident that if you develop something which is safe and effective, then we'll buy it. And it seems to me that that's a clever allocation of risk. Have the government or the public sector bear the demand risk and have the private sector bear the performance risk. Thanks, Tom. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mindful of, of time that goes by so quickly and in good company. Um, I wanted to maybe just squeeze in one last question, uh, also something that Millie touched on in her questions. Um, and what's been bucking us in this learning festival generally, which is, you know, it seems to be that, that this crisis is enabling a lot of possibility that wasn't there uh, before. And that might be a positive thing. And, and, and then there's a question that, that gets a lot, which is like, how do we keep this urgency, not just on COVID, but on climate change and other issues? Um, uh, or maybe the question is, what are the teachable moments that we can capture from this moment so we can rearrange the organizational conditions 
to uh, to support more of this work if we think that that's what it takes to really drive change uh, that is needed. So a couple of quick thoughts from from you, all of you on, on that, and then we'll have to close down. Um, we had this uh, bulletin board. Uh, we had this whiteboard in our office, and we, we would have these aphorisms um, that captured some insight. And one of them was, the schedule is your friend. Uh, and what that meant was that if you managed to get one of your ideas on the president's schedule, then the entire government would have to <laughs> cooperate with you uh, because you couldn't ask the president of the United States for an extension. Um, so so um, I do think that there that the leaders of organizations uh, can't, you know, if, if you don't have a real deadline, uh, you can create uh, uh, artificial deadlines by saying, you know, I want this thing, uh, you know, done by this period of time. Um, and, uh, you know, in the, in the absence of a crisis of, of dealing something which is important but not urgent, uh, then I think leaders can create a sense of urgency. But it's clearly, it's much more difficult uh, than when you have a, you know, a, a, real, uh, a, a real thing. What, one of the things I hope we do is that there are a number of things that we've done around telemedicine and telehealth in response to the crisis that I think are things that we should be doing long term. Um, so I hope when we have an after action review, uh, we identify some of these things that uh, we should keep on doing, even though it took an emergency for us to make a change. Mm. Thanks, Tom. Millie? Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, the last point that Tom made, I would, I would try to see what are the quirks that have been happening more often since the pandemic hit that we want to leave and, and have part of our reality after the pandemic is over. So Victoria's ambidextrous government, right? So we see many different governments sort of setting in place short-term triage team with a long-term uh, sort of mission focused on the, on the policy and mission team working together, uh, things like these. Because um, I think there was a really interesting podcast with uh, Ezra Klein and Mariana Mazzucato. They then, you know, he asked her, so, you know, if, if nurses are so important, why don't we pay them more? I mean, it's just easy. We pay them more. And she said, well, it's the whole system around nurses. We don't actually deem them, uh, um, you know, important enough to build the whole system around nurses. And I think this is how I look at um, uh, kind of engineering the urgency. If, if these are the things that we find important, it's not just enough to, to, to spotlight them, but network people in, uh, bring more on board, build concentric circles around them, press on them so they become more of an, a reality. Thank you, Millie. Chad? Yeah, this, this is a, a, gonna be a question that will perplex us in, in, in many different ways. Uh, I will say from my side, um, the best thing that we can possibly do is to start working on it now. We actually may not know what the actual answer is. Uh, but let's just project out, uh, let's say a year from now or two years from now or however long this crisis in whatever form it continues to evolve and will, uh, will continue to perpetuate. Um, the, what's clear to me is that governments around the world have expended billions, of, well, I guess it's, I should say trillions of dollars, billions uh, uh, per jurisdiction, but trillions in total to help overcome this, uh, which means when the... Uh, the reins are pulled back around government's role in helping to overcome the pandemic, there will be uh, an intense need for governments to do more with less. And, and if we don't start working on the strategy to do more with less at this point in time, which is one of the key aspects of what an entrepreneur can help under, understand and then uncover as far as solutions go, uh, we will have missed a great opportunity. Uh, that narrative is starting to come out in the Canadian context. Uh, around climate change and the environment. Uh, and it would behoove us, I think, globally if we do not kind of look at starting now, knowing that there will be a, uh, a really important thirst and need by governments around the world to, to kind of take that approach where, where's the next big idea now that we're trying to come back to a normal state of operations. Great, thank you all of you. Uh, and on that note, we will close the session. Um, and I think it certainly lived up to what we are trying to achieve with the State of Change Learning Festival, which is to get to better questions, which I think it was a lot of between all of you. So thank you, Tom, Millie, and Chad, 
for joining us and thank you all for, uh, for being a part of the session. Um, uh, well, further exploration needed, uh, but until next time, um, take care and, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.